Sitting is resumed and it is now time for questions to the Minister for Justice. I call Andy Allen. Members will be aware that while the Executive Action Plan is coordinated within my department, the programme is a cross-executive one. The five-year funding period for tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime programme ends in March 2021. Consistent with commitments in New Decade and Your Approach, the Executive has confirmed its support for an extension of the programme contingent upon financial support from the UK Government. Good progress has been made, but we must do more. Lessons learned from the first phase underline the enduring pervasive nature of paramilitarism and the need for a long-term, genuinely collaborative approach. Extending the programme will facilitate a renewed focus on keeping people safe from harm by building resilience and creating fairer, safer communities, free from paramilitarism, criminality and coercive control, at the same time helping to ensure the success of the wider executive's objectives. Planning for this new phase is underway across the executive and the newly reconvened political advisory group, which I chair, will provide fresh political leadership on these important issues and ensure that the programme and executive actions are focused on delivering a positive impact in communities. As part of this wider executive effort, my department is pressing ahead with legislation on committal and the commencement of the Criminal Finances Act 2017. Two public consultations are also underway, one on legislative proposals for new organised crime offences and another on a new multi-agency draft strategy to protect individuals, communities and businesses from organised crime. I call Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, as you're well aware, um, paramilitarism and organised crime has affected far too many lives right across Northern Ireland. Uh, and I look to many of our young people who uh, these organised crime bosses prey upon, uh, the impressionable young people, and they get them to do their bidding. Can I ask, Minister, what engagement you've had with your ministerial colleague, the Minister for Education, around creating a preventative education programme to, uh, to prevent our young people getting caught up in these organised crime and paramilitaries? Well, I thank the member for the supplementary. Clearly, di diverting young people away from the criminal justice system and tackling um, the underlying vulnerabilities in the community is something that both the education minister, the health minister, the communities minister, and indeed the executive office are engaged in um, as part of this programme. I think it's hugely important that we look not only at education in terms of building resilience, um, but that we also look at the community conditions which lead to people being vulnerable um, to paramilitary activity and being vulnerable vulnerable to, as the member quite rightly says, exploitation and abuse um, by those behind these paramilitary organisations. I call Paul Given. Thank you. Uh, the, the Minister will know that paramilitaries seek to uh, exert control in many different facets across our society and indeed within our institutions. She will be aware of the ongoing efforts in McGabry Prison at Rowe House. Uh, the Minister will know uh, that efforts are being made to hold a protest, a mass protest, outside McGabry Prison on Saturday. Can she give an assurance to this House that under no circumstances will any protest or indeed a 24-hour camp be facilitated within the compounds of her facilities at McGabry Prison? And in doing so, she can be assured of my full support in stopping it. Well, the member has made reference to the situation which has developed in McGabry um, over recent weeks, and I think it's important that we clarify the situation in respect of that before I move on um, to a substantive point. Members will be aware that there are a number of prisoners in the Republican separated unit in McGabry who are currently refusing prison food. Um, I think we're now at approximately day seven of that protest um, in response to um, the fact that a prisoner had to be um, removed from the prison for medical treatment and on the return had to go through the normal COVID procedures um, of entering isolation units uh, for, um, for uh, two weeks. Um, and in protest at that, we have now had this develop. We put the safety of our prisoners and our prison staff at the forefront of all we do in the prisons. And so it is hugely important that we keep COVID out of the prison. And for that reason, it is vitally important that people go through that process. Over a thousand prisoners have gone through that process already. Um, and we have been very successful in that only one prisoner has actually been tested positive um, for COVID. With respect to the protest, of which I am aware, 
We will be liaising with the PSNI and with the other statutory agencies to ensure that that is handled in an appropriate way. It would be inappropriate for me to give guarantees ahead of those discussions um, on what may or may not be the appropriate way forward because, as with all protests, the focus will be on ensuring that public order and, and life is protected throughout all stages of any protest, um, but we will be liaising with the police to ensure that the disruption um, to those living in the immediate area and those going to and from the prison um, for work or other purposes um, are not disrupted. I call Kiva Archibald. I thank the Minister for her responses so far. In your original answer, Minister, you talked of a collaborative approach. Can you confirm that community involvement in the development of strategies to tackle paramilitarism and organised crime will be the centre of your department's approach to this issue? I think it's hugely important. I think that the paramilitary programme um, to date, the tackling paramilitary programme, has been successful in building those bridges into communities and working with local communities in terms of how we develop um, our proposals going forward. The political panel also gives an added impetus to that in that there is political leadership elected from communities to be able to have oversight of what happens and feedback into those communities the sort of actions that we want to take. It is a hugely important piece of work and it isn't just about punishing those who are guilty. It is also about building resilience um, within communities so that they can resist the lure of paramilitarism but also so that they have full confidence not only in the police, um, but also in councils, in the housing executive, and in members of this place, um, to help them in their resistance against paramilitary activity, uh, which is damaging their local community. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, of course, uh, tackling criminality uh, and paramilitarism isn't down just to your department, and I declare an interest to member of the policing board. But, Minister, you may be aware that the Director General of the NCA is due to come to give a, an, an updated report in December uh, to the policing board. Um, will you uh, support the policing board in calling for NCA to uh, actually start to target more um, um, particularly uh, organised criminal gangs, which might well be below the sort of threshold at which NCA gets involved in organised crime uh, elsewhere, but it, it, it is an imperative that we have those resources available to us. Well, I think in answering that question, the first thing I would have to do is pay tribute to the PSNI and to um, the NCA for the excellent work they have been doing in terms of tackling organised crime. They have had some major successes um, over recent weeks and months, and I think that that is something that we should obviously welcome. Um, I certainly um, have no issue with the NCA working with the PSNI in close cooperation under the scrutiny and under the direction of the board um, in terms of how they want to go about their work, but it would be inappropriate for me, obviously, to give direction on what are operational policing matters. However, they're well aware of the priority that I place um, on tackling paramilitarism and organised crime. And I think most of the people in this House and an increasing number of people outside would, would readily admit that there is a paper-thin distinction in many cases between those who are engaged in organised crime and those who claim to be paramilitary organisations. Can I advise members that question three has been withdrawn, so I now call uh, David Hellage. My department is working at a number of levels to address the issue of substance misuse across Northern Ireland. In partnership with the Northern Ireland Policing Board, we provide funding for policing and community safety partnerships. These partnerships in each district council area have a lead role in identifying and addressing community safety and policing issues. The PCSP covering East Antrim has identified drugs misuse as a high priority and is delivering various initiatives to tackle misuse, including the provision of information and support to those at risk, in order to raise awareness of the effects and risks of using and misusing illegal and or prescription drugs. The PSNI is also involved in the delivery of a multi-agency drug strategy in the Mid and East Antrim district. This ensures that collaborative working is in place and information sharing on threats, harms and risks so that they can be identified and enforcement action is taken against those intent on harming our communities. Since the introduction of the strategy in Mid and East Antrim district, PSNI supply and possession detections have increased. PSNI is also referring more people to the relevant agencies to help them get the support they need to deal with the root causes of their vulnerability. That multi-agency approach also enables a range of support services to be directed to those identified as vulnerable and in need of protection. 
the Executive Action Plan to tackle paramilitary activity and criminality and organised crime is also supporting a number of projects currently operating in Mid and East Antrim to address the harm caused to communities by paramilitary organisations. And the Paramilitary Crime Task Force is a specific resource um, focused on tackling criminality associated with paramilitary groups, including the supply of drugs. Finally, the successful uh, operational partnership working of the drug subgroup of the Organised Crime Task Force was demonstrated very clearly only last week when the PSNI, National Crime Agency and other partners successfully removed £1 million of cocaine from the drug supply entering Northern Ireland, disrupting the activities of this group of criminals. I call David Hillage for supplementary. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Indeed, I pay tribute also to those who are working on the front line currently in a very difficult situation. Anyone who has watched the local news last night will be very aware of the specific difficulties criminal gangs bring upon East Antrim. The area is currently awash with the drug MDMA, and there have been a number of very serious incidents involving young people, indeed very lucky to have not had a fatality, and if it was not for the emergency services, there would have been at least maybe two. Will the Minister use whatever influence she can bring to bear to rid our community of these uh, criminal drug dealing gangs? The Member has my assurance on that regard. I would want to see those drugs off our streets and I would want to see those who are vulnerable supported in such a way that they are no longer vulnerable to those who are dealing drugs on the streets. It is very clear that for many young people, even one experiment with drugs can end in tragedy. And so it's important that we get the message out that there is no safe amount of drugs that people can take. There is no safe um, threshold for, for experimentation with drugs. And young people should not risk their lives. And people who are feeding that habit and feeding those drugs to them, um, I think, need to take responsibility and be dealt with in a proportionate way. I call Emma Rogan. As the Minister will be aware, um, drug misuse affects all communities from all constituencies and often derives from a, a deeper rooted cause, which was recognised with the introduction of a trial on the Substance Misuse Court. Can the Minister give an update on this court? The Substance Misuse Court um, is one of a number um, of opportunities that we have taken within the Department to try to tackle the causes um, of crime as well as tackle um, the outworkings of it in the community. It is an opportunity um, as a problem-solving court um, to be able to um, pilot more innovative ways forward and to be able to address um, all of those issues. So the Substance Misuse Court is part of an overall strategy which also is there to help individuals be able to tackle um, the issues directly or indirectly associated with substance misuse. Um, we also support hubs. We have the enhanced combination orders, uh, which oper operate um, in specific areas. We have a family drug and alcohol court, which is currently being evaluated. And then we also have the mental health court, which is currently subject to a scoping study. We're finalising a draft problem-solving justice five-year strategic plan based on evidence from the independent evaluations of these initiatives, which includes consideration of options for the rollout of them to other areas to produce the right outcomes for individuals, families and communities. I call Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, having received a, another phone call this morning from the police uh, outlining a new threat against me uh, from the South East Antrim uh, UDA uh, because I dared challenge them about their drugs activities in that area, uh, will the Minister just absolutely confirm that any of these people who are arrested for drugs offences will not find themselves in a separated prison regime? First of all, can I condemn those who are behind the threats um, against the member? It is completely unacceptable that any member of this House or any other House is subject to threats by illegal organisations for speaking their mind and representing the people who elected them to do so. Particularly, I find it invidious when they are being threatened for standing up for the rule of law. And so I would have to condemn um, those who are behind those threats and offer my support um, to the member in question for what he has been put through on this issue. With respect to the allocation of people to the separated regime, as the member is well aware, the decision on whether a prisoner enters the separated regime is not one for the Department of Justice. It is, it is a decision that is made um, by the Secretary of State according to the rules laid down by the Northern Ireland Office. Our duty as the Department of Justice is simply to support those in our care once they have been committed to our care. Moving on, I call Andrew Muir.
My officials are working at pace with law enforcement partners, other Northern Ireland executive departments and UK government on operational readiness to ensure that my department and our justice partners are prepared as we can be for the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. Relations between our Northern Ireland justice agencies and their counterparts in Ireland are also good. However, a non-negotiated outcome remains a possibility and there remain unresolved issues around what measures will be available to law enforcement partners to tackle pan-EU crime and cross-border crime in Ireland. Until we have more clarity around the outcome of the negotiations and until the working, outworking of the Northern Ireland Protocol is fully implemented, we will be unable to fully prepare for exit from the transition period. The internal market bill recently introduced to Westminster has created further confusion and uncertainty. The UK government's intention to undermine the withdrawal agreement um, and the Northern Ireland Protocol has the potential to impact on the negotiations around a future security partnership with the EU, and this is to be regretted. I met with the Home Secretary on the 10th of September, and as a part of a very constructive meeting, I took the opportunity to reinforce that lack of detail around the negotiations and implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol is hampering our ability to plan fully for exit from the transition period. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. The clock's ticking down to the end of the transition period. We're running out of time. Does the Minister agree that there's a real risk posed by a lack of agreement thus far on data accuracy and also in terms of civil justice measures? Well, the member is correct. Um, there is currently no agreement on data adequacy. I have reinforced to UK ministers the need for measures to mitigate against any negative impacts that might arise from a loss of unrestricted cross-border data flows. Data sharing is absolutely crucial to law enforcement in Northern Ireland, particularly tackling cross-border crime, and it underpins many of the existing EU criminal justice tools and measures relied on for detection and prosecution of pan-EU crime. I'm concerned about the potential loss of access to these justice measures that support the fight against those crimes. Loss of access to vital tools such as CIS2, PROM and ECRIS would be detrimental with the potential to seriously compromise Europe-wide investigations. Therefore, adequate, efficient and effective data sharing with EU countries in the future will be vital in maintaining operational capacity, particularly with Ireland. PSNI share and receive data with other law enforcement partners on a daily basis. We have been engaged with Home Office colleagues in order to ensure that that, that future security partnership will be able to take things forward. With respect to the issue of civil justice, it is being negotiated not as part of the future security partnership, um, but as part of the wider uh, trade negotiations, and as such is not um, a priority for the UK government at this time. I call Pat Sheen. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. And, uh, Brexit is, is probably going to mean a loss of access to some of the important EU justice and security uh, cooperation mechanisms. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, in the light of that, has the Minister had any meetings with her southern counterpart, and could she detail what those meetings have been? Well, I thank the member um, for that question. I have indeed um, had discussions uh, with Minister McEntee, um, and obviously Brexit is one of the issues that has, has been highlighted as part of that negotiation. It is also worth members noting that should we end up in a situation where the future security partnership um, is not agreed, as the, it is coupled at the current time to the trade negotiations, so both have to be agreed for either to be implemented, um, then we are reliant entirely on the protocol in order to be able to negotiate bilateral arrangements um, with Ireland in order to move forward. So there are challenges if we don't have the protocol and that we move back to a situation where we have a cliff edge. There are about 40 EU justice and security measures that would fall under a no-deal Brexit. Their loss would impact significantly on the ability of the UK law enforcement agencies to address uh, pan-EU crime, and that would include cross-border crime on this island. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It seems from what the Justice Minister is saying that we face a crisis at the end of this year in law enforcement if we crash out without a deal. Will she confirm that the protocol does not cover justice and security measures? Will she further confirm that her permanent secretary told the House of Commons Select Committee last year, this time last year, that not having the European arrest warrant would, be, would be, increase bur the burden on law enforcement agencies to swap information across this border? And would she further raise, as a matter of urgency, at the North South Ministerial Council the need to ensure that we have 
adequate protections in terms of north-south law enforcement on the 1st of January next year? Well, I think that there are a number of threads to the question. Firstly, um, the, the Future Security Partnership is actually making much better progress in terms of negotiations with the EU um, than the Trade Partnership would appear to be, certainly at this remove. Um, the Future Security Partnership is in everyone's interest because much of the crime that we have in Northern Ireland isn't generated here, and equally, crime that is generated here can happen anywhere in the rest of the EU. So there is mutual benefit to us finding an agreed way forward. The difficulty comes if it remains coupled to the trade negotiations, and those trade negotiations are unsuccessfully um, concluded, and we end up with neither a trade agreement in place nor um, a future security partnership. It is also true to say that if we don't know exactly what the trade arrangements are to be, we risk creating a much more complex landscape um, for justice agencies because we will have, ha we will have layers of non-compliance from those who are ignorant of the requirements on their business to those who are deliberately ignoring the requirements on their business to those who are in the black market. And what we do not want to do is punish people who genuinely want to comply with the law by creating any grey areas um, and force them into an area of non-compliance. It is a hugely important issue and it is a hugely serious one. We could end up in a situation where, for example, European arrest warrants and other key tools that we have been able to use have to be renegotiated under bilateral agreements with each individual country if we're not able to do that as part of the overall um, agreement that is reached with the UK at that level. I don't believe that that's a helpful way forward. We have these tools in place. I think our focus has to be on getting an agreement on the future security partnership, if nothing else, so that we at least can uh, secure the future and make our, our population feel safe um, without actually, if we, even if we don't get to the point where we have an agreed trade agreement. Can I encourage members to continue to rise in the place if they still have a question to ask? I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline what budget has been allocated to Brexit within the Department of Justice and if any funding issues have arisen in the last couple of months? I don't have the figures to hand um, on the amount that has been allocated so far to um, EU developments, but I know that at the moment we don't have um, any additional budget issues at this point. However, we have raised um, with the Department of Finance as responsible um, account holders the, the potential for this to become a very expensive process if we, uh, if we end the transition period without an agreement, because then obviously um, this will become very difficult and potentially more cumbersome for law enforcement agencies as well. But at this point, um, we are not in that situation. And as you know, um, Brexit issues are being handled separate to the normal budget, so it isn't causing pressures in the, in the department's budget at this point in time. Moving on, I call Paul Free. Five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Legal aid for some family cases is subject to a means test and a merit test, which means there are circumstances when only one parent will be entitled to legal aid. There are, however, a number of protections in place to reduce the potential for abuse. When considering legal aid applications, the legal service agency may consider an applicant's legal aid history and other factors such as inter-party correspondence, information from the instructing solicitor and previous proceedings or court orders. Anyone concerned about the use of legal aid funding in a case can also write to the agency. It is also possible to make an application to the court or for the court of its own motion to make an order preventing further applications for contact or residence without leave of the court. While it is important to have these checks in place, it is equally important to recognise parental disputes that revert back to court can involve a degree of acrimony which makes it unlikely arrangements for children will be sustained. Supporting relations between parents is key to avoiding that acrimony and the potential negative and financial consequences of parental disputes. I'm currently working with the Department of Health to consider actions which might be introduced to improve outcomes for families and children. I call Paul Free for supplement. I thank the Minister for her response and her answer. And again, this does uh, encroach on an access to justice issue uh, for many people, and I understand that. But given the fact that some ex-partners use court as an actual weapon against uh, their ex-partner, and that by running down resource and savings of an ex-partner can actually hurt uh, and affect children, both in the short term and long term, 
Is there anything that the Minister can do, apart from what she's outlined here, what, what, that her department can do and that the court processes can do, to protect those people who find that their savings, lifelong savings in many cases, is being dwindled? And is the Minister actively looking at her domestic violence and family proceedings bill in order to try and achieve something in that regard? Well, of course, the member is right, and I think all of us as members of this Assembly will have been approached by parents who believe that there are vexatious um, returns to the family courts um, in order to try to exacerbate um, loss of income, loss of earnings, and also the cost of legal representation. To be clear, that the family courts, um, in general terms, um, are supposed to be there in order to try to get mediated solutions and should not be a combative place. However, you are correct that once somebody has legal representation, then things will, will dramatically escalate. The merit of applications and how they progress obviously is a matter for the judiciary and their best place to assess the need for an adjudication and also to manage how parties engage in order to guard against such vexatious behaviours. In considering applications um, relating to children, the paramount consideration under the legal framework of the Children Northern Ireland Order is the welfare of the child. Um, the impact and the degree to which litigation furthers child welfare will inform those judicial decisions. It would therefore be very difficult um, to develop an alternative framework um, for moderating the exercise of parental rights and responsibilities or preventing applications being issued. However, as part of the work we're doing around the domestic um, abuse bill, you will be aware that we want the family courts to be able to take cognizance of the fact that if someone has had conviction um, under the domestic abuse bill, that that should be taken into account when they're making their decisions. I call Orlea Flynn. Last can call you. Can I ask the Minister to outline if she has any plans to reform the legal aid system? Thank you. Um, the legal aid system was extensively reformed by David Ford during his tenure as Justice Minister, and it wouldn't be my intention um, to undertake major reform of the legal aid system at this point in time. However, there are um, some areas of legal aid which do require further consideration, and the Department is taking those forward at the moment to ensure that the system is fair, that it is accessible to those who need it, but also that it doesn't create the sorts of disparities and issues that members have already referred to um, during this session. I call Justin McNulty. Yes, can I call and further to Mr. Frew's question and uh, supplementary question, Minister, can I ask what um, protections are in place to protect someone? who has been subjected to persistent, um, unfounded legal action? Well, I think the first issue that I've already referenced is that the judge can, of their own volition, um, decide that the case is vexatious and can make an order that for any further hearings to be brought before the courts will require leave of the court in order to do so. If that isn't happening as a result of the, the judiciary acting independently, the person who feels that they are being vexatiously pursued through the courts can, of course, make an appeal um, to the judiciary and write to them to ask them to do that. Moving on, I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number six. My department carried out a consultation in 2018 inviting public opinion on a number of legislative proposals aimed at addressing antisocial behaviour. A full summary of responses was published on the department's website in December 2019. Since then, my officials have established a multi-agency review group to consider the effectiveness of current antisocial behaviour legislation in managing antisocial behaviours, as well as any new legislation which may be required. In parallel, my officials have also commenced a scoping exercise to identify, where possible, an evidence base that will indicate how successful some of the proposed legislative measures as introduced in the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014 and as set out in the consult document, consultation document have been. Recognising that legislation alone will not resolve this issue, the review group's work is also seeking to inform discussion on the barriers and solutions to manage non-legislative responses to ASB, including greater use of preventative and early intervention initiatives to address behaviours and any structures to allow for partnership and collaborative working. I call Claire Sugden for a quick supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for progressing this really important work. Does the Minister have capacity in her legislative programme to strengthen the law in this area before the end of the mandate? 
I think it's very important to say that in response to the consultation, we had very mixed responses. There were no conclusive um, areas where everyone was agreed that we should take forward additional legislation, which is why the uh, cross-sectoral working group has been set up. As a result of that, there is some complex work going on in terms of trying to develop an evidence base. I think it's therefore unlikely that we will bring forward new um, legislation in this mandate to deal specifically with antisocial behaviour. However, the non-legislative approaches which I've referred to may be able to take that forward. That is the end of our time for listed questions to the Minister, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Cahill Boylan. Asking Kanye, and just could I ask the Minister what actions she has taken to prevent illegal dumping in the border areas? Uh, responsibility for illegal dumping lies primarily with the Department of Agriculture um, uh, rather than um, the Department of Justice. However, there have been a number um, of operations that have taken place um, jointly with the Department of Agriculture over many, many years, um, particularly where that illegal dumping is also related to organised crime um, or other illegal activity. I call Cathal Boylan for supplementary. Thank you, Ashwin Corley, and could I thank the Minister for our answer? I believe, Minister, there is an area in New and Armagh which is known as the Caricatuk viewpoint, which is the fused forest, and there has been a number of illegal dumpings over the last number of years in particular, but more so over the COVID period, and there has been commercial waste involved in it. And I could uh, just ask the Minister to maybe engage with her southern counterpart and with the DRM Minister to try and prevent that kind of illegal dumping in the fused forest. Good morning, Margaret. I would be more than happy to do so, and if it would be helpful if the member could write to me giving more detail of the particular allegations, I can get those followed up um, with the Department of Agriculture and indeed on a cross border basis. Thank you. I call Paula Bradley. Um, I'm just going to follow on from Paul Frew's question and a question I'd previously asked the Minister a question time, and it's to do with contempt of court for those parents. Um, and we know we've seen it, especially during COVID, um, who haven't had access to their children. Um, it's just to see if there's what, there could be a more streamlined service there when it comes to contempt of court, because the issues go on and on and on, and absent parents uh, just grows longer for them not seeing their children. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that obviously the handling of individual cases is a matter for the judiciary and it isn't something into which I can intervene. So when cases take slightly longer um, than is perhaps ideal, that's not something that I, I can personally um, intervene around. However, we are making every effort, particularly given COVID, to recover the system um, as rapidly as possible. And we have focused on those areas where there are particular harms that could accrue from not actually being able um, to access a judgment. As you'll be aware, um, the Lord Chief Justice's Office Publish guidance for families who are struggling with family contact um, earlier during the coronavirus crisis um, in order to put in place measures where they could actually seek the support of the judiciary where uh, orders were being broken. These are very sensitive matters and they require sensitive handling and I, I understand um, the point that's being made. However, it is really for um, individuals who find themselves in that situation to pursue that with their own solicitor um, and with the judge who is in charge of their case. Call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, then, on the second point that Mr. Free made about the domestic abuse bill, um, we know at Westminster um, that, that uh, children uh, are, are part of that domestic abuse bill, and we know that, that for many parents out there, there is good reason why uh, an absent parent should not be seeing their children, and there certainly is good reason behind that. But for many, there is no good reason. Um, so it's just looking, will she look at that in the domestic abuse bill, um, that that is uh, abuse against a child, them not seeing their, their, their other parent? There is, there is obviously an issue where the court has already made a ruling. Um, I think it would be fair to say that relationships have clearly broken down between parents, and so the children are already disadvantaged in that regard. It is much preferable at the breakup of a relationship if parents can work together in the best interest of the children and form a cooperative relationship at that level. Um, once things get to court, it always gets more fraud, and I think that that is part of the challenge that we face. In terms of the domestic abuse bill, we do have issues, for example, where children there is a child aggravator um, within the domestic abuse bill, so that if a child is exposed to domestic abuse in the home, that will be taken into account. And we have also listened very carefully to the committee with respect to the importance of the family courts, recognising where someone has, for example, in the past um, been found guilty of a domestic abuse offence 
sense that that should be considered um, when they look at things like child contact and how that may be arranged. However, as I said in answer um, to uh, Mr Frew's question earlier, I, I think it's hugely important that we recognise that the, the family contact um, arrangements that are operating within the courts are therefore the benefit of the child and solely the benefit of the child. Often they are not welcomed by the parents, um, but they are there in the best interest of the child and protecting their access to both parents. I call Andrew Muir. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, as the Minister be aware, the family of Lisa Dorian are from North Down, and she will have received correspondence from them and also from the family of Charlotte Murray on their campaign for Charlotte's Law. Could the Minister update us on her position with regards to her proposal to change the law? I thank the member for the question. Um, and I think the first thing that I would want to say is that I think anyone who has um, heard the story um, of Lisa Dorian um, and of Charlotte Murray will recognise the huge pain and the added anguish um, that, that, that not knowing where their remains have been laid um, creates for the family as they deal with their grief. Um, I had planned to meet with Charlotte and with Lisa's families prior to COVID restrictions being introduced, um, and those meetings have had to be postponed. Um, my office has been in recent contact to try to reschedule those meetings as soon as regulations and guidance permit us to do that. I acknowledge that such matters would be routinely considered by the parole commissioners for Northern Ireland when assessing prisoner suitability for release on licence. However, I have already um, commissioned a focus consultation with key stakeholders on Charlotte's Law, or Helen's Law, as I think it's known in England, um, to run in parallel with finalising the outcome and next steps flowing from the sentencing review, including legislation where that is appropriate. As part of that, I've asked my officials to very urgently engage with the parole commissioners and with other stakeholders, and will give de uh, detailed consideration to the way forward in light of those discussions. There is an Assembly motion scheduled for next week seeking the introduction of legislation similar to Helen's Law, and so I will also be listening to that debate very carefully and reflecting on the points made there as we seek to take this forward. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Um, the body of Lisa Dorian has never been recovered to date. There is a bench in Castle Park in Bangor to remember Lisa. And one of the hardest moments for me is when people are asking me, what was that bench for? It's to remember someone whose body has never been found. And would the Minister join with me in encouraging anyone with any information whatsoever to bring it forward to the police so we can enable the recovery of Lisa's body? I would have no hesitation in doing so whatsoever. Um, it is part of the grieving process for any family who has been subjected to such a uh, traumatic loss. Um, to be able to bury the remains of their, their loved one, but also to be able to revisit their grave, to be able to spend time there um, and to come to terms with the loss that they have suffered. To not only rob a family um, of their family member, but to rob them of that opportunity um, for grief and for healing, I think is a despicable act. And I would encourage anyone who could help any family in that situation to come forward and be of assistance. And I call Emma Sheeran. The department published a statistical bulletin last week on case pro uh, processing time for criminal cases dealt with at courts in 2019-20. Can the minister give her assessment on its findings, please? Well, in terms of courts and recovery, I think everyone will recognise that this has been an incredibly difficult period for the court system, um, and it has been a challenging period for us um, in terms of being able to take forward the normal justice system. Um, but we have had to work through that, and we now, as you know, have been able to restart um, our. We've been able to restart work on um, jury trials. We have also um, now been able to start to reopen additional courts in, in addition to the, the first one that reopened in Laganside um, last month. Um, we are intent on being in a position to start to deal with the backlog. But there are many moving parts to that. It requires cooperation of the police, the PPS, the judiciary themselves in terms of scheduling those cases. Um, and so we are working through that. And thankfully, um, we have been able to do so uh, to date through the Criminal Justice Board um, achieve a, a, a stable way of going forward. 
I think the criminal justice system has had to respond very rapidly and innovatively because we need to maintain confidence in the system, not just from our own staff, um, but also from the public who use the system and those who are in our care. We are looking at a model um, in terms of when backlogs will be cleared so we can give people some certainty around that. But I think in general terms, um, the, there is clearly a significant backlog, um, but it is one that we are determined to try and work our way through. And we're using some innovative means, including looking at alternative venues in order to be able to expedite that process, particularly focusing um, on those vulnerable victims for whom long waits may lead to higher attrition rates with those uh, convictions. Call Emma Sheeran for supplement. Burmaga, Minister, thanks for your answer. Although on paper there is a 10.8 per cent decrease in the medium time taken for a case to be dealt with, in reality for most Crown Court cases the average reduction was only from 866 days to 861 days, which isn't much of an improvement for victims. Will the Minister take steps to ensure a significant improvement in these case times? Well, I think the first thing to say is that post-COVID, we would expect those times to actually increase, and I think that is a reality of where we're at. I think we were very fortunate that going into the crisis, we had had that 10% reduction in terms of case progression. Um, however, it's also worth noting that in the autumn, I intend to bring forward a committal reform bill, which should again expedite um, the, the system um, and allow cases to be heard much more quickly than is currently the case. Um, and so the Assembly and the Committee will have an opportunity to scrutinise that bill, um, hopefully um, not before too long. I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, and can I first of all associate myself with the remarks of the Minister and Mr Muir in relation to the Dorian family, indeed all families who find themselves in that dreadful situation. Minister, you will know in North Belfast we have more interfaces than any other constituency in Northern Ireland. In a normal society, we would want those interfaces removed. But could I say to the Minister, would she agree with me that those interface structures, whether they be gates, walls or fences, can only be removed with the support and the agreement of the communities that are on either side? Well, we are certainly committed in the department in terms of working with interface structures, and not all of them, of course, are in the ownership of the department, but we are committed to working with people on the ground to build the trust and confidence that is necessary. I think we also need to be honest and say that we cannot always wait for the slowest moving part um, to agree um, to those interface barriers and structures being amended and changed, because to do so would mean that no change would ever happen. There is, of course, anxiety when we remove those structures, because people rely on those structures for their own sense of safety and security. So it's important that as we move towards the removal of structures, we bring the community with us, but we also put in place alternative mechanisms for people to deal with their anxieties and be able to um, deal with community resolution and dispute resolution in a way that is more constructive than perhaps has been the case in the past. Call William Humphrey. Minister for our answer. And the Minister uses the word trust. I have to say in many cases that, that trust is not there for, for very obvious uh, and understandable reasons. But I, I, I thank the Minister for her words, but I would just say that there can only be the removal, and we will only support the removal of those structures if that trust is there and both, both, with both communities. I want to see the society normalised as much as the Minister does, absolutely. But when you visit homes, I last night visited Lower Old Park, three homes attacked in the last eight, eight days, sustained attacks on that community, people very nervous, right across North Belfast, which has been a very difficult summer, and, and the department, the police, must take those views, those concerns and those fears into consideration. I thank the member and we, I can assure him that we absolutely do take those fears into consideration. We also have to be conscious that this is not a normal um, society, much as we wish that it were. And we recognise that there are huge anxieties stemming from historic incidents, but also current incidents of intercommunal violence in those neighbourhoods. We always try to proceed with the precautionary principle in that we want people to be confident and feel safe in their homes. That is the purpose of the work that the department does, and I can assure him that people's fears will not be disregarded by my officials. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. As party leader, Mrs Long opposes segregation, division and duplication, and yet, as Justice Minister, she presides over segregated prisons. What actions is she taking to address that inconsistency? 
Well, Mr Speaker, there is no inconsistency because I have inherited a system seven months ago that is as it is, um, and it is my duty to ensure that everyone committed to our care, whether they're in the separated system or whether they're in the main body of the prison, are properly cared for and the right uh, responsible uh, measures are put in place to take care of them. I, like the member, would like to see um, an end to separation because we recognise that it is an anomaly and an unhelpful anomaly within the system. It is also a costly one. So so I by no means try to diminish it. However, I believe that the solutions to separation within the prison don't just lie within the walls of our prison system. They lie also with the community outside. I call Mike Nesbitt for a quick supplementary. Well, again, I ask what steps is she taking to address this issue? And again, I will remind the member that the current arrangements on separation lie with the Northern Ireland Office and the Secretary of State. When they commit someone to our prison into the separated regime, my duty is to ensure that that person's wishes are respected um, and that the prison system does its job. It is not my duty to direct the Secretary of State. And that is the end of our questions to the Minister for Justice. And ask members to take their ease for a few moments.